This is a Fox News alert. Welcome to Washington. I'm Brett Baer. Republicans tonight are making a last minute push to keep fighting against the president's Iran nuclear deal. As you look at the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell on the Senate floor live right now. Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel here with breaking details. Good evening, Mike. Well, Brett, good evening. Republicans on Capitol Hill call this Iran nuclear deal one of the biggest foreign policy changes in a generation. So the next step in this fight will be an amendment to be announced by the Senate Majority Leader. Mitch McConnell will say that he will file an amendment that would prevent the president from lifting sanctions until Iran meets two simple benchmarks. It must formally recognize Israel's right to exist, and it must release the American citizens being held in Iranian custody. The idea is applying more pressure on Senate Democrats to join with Ben Cardin, Joe Manchin, Bob Menendez, and Chuck Schumer in voting with Republicans. On the Senate floor, we expect that lawmakers are going to vote again to see if they can get to 60 votes on a procedural step to disapprove the Iran nuclear deal. Last Thursday, that fell short 58 to 42. Most are expecting the same outcome tonight, and some are calling on McConnell to use the so-called nuclear option and pass the disapproval measure with a simple majority. Later this week, the plan is he would call for a vote on this new measure, pushing Iran to recognize Israel and to demand Americans being held hostage are released. Brett? All right, Mike, just to be clear, I mean, the, the chance that this is going to change the dynamic here and Republicans would be able to block it is, is minuscule, right? I mean, this is really to get Democrats on the record against these two things. Absolutely correct. You saw the House take a different approach, taking a three-step process last week. The Senate's trying to do what it can to get everybody on the record on this Iran nuclear deal to be able to go out and say to President Obama, you see, a number of Democrats are also opposed to this Iran nuclear measure, as many and the American public are, and so they're trying to get them on the record, and so McConnell's looking at different ways, such as recognizing Israel's rights to exist and releasing those American prisoners as a way to get to that point, Brett. Okay, Mike, thank you. We'll head back for breaking details and more on this with the panel. Meantime, Israel's Prime Minister held an emergency meeting today following a third day of violence at Jerusalem's most sensitive holy site. Israeli police clashed with Palestinian protesters at the Temple Mount. Police say protesters threw rocks, fireworks, and concrete blocks, and a firebomb at officers. The director of the Al-Aqsa Mosque blamed Israeli police for the tensions. While Israel deals with the Temple Mount, it also fears a much bigger threat, a terrorist it believes is being sponsored by Iran. Correspondent Connor Powell has details from Jerusalem. As the Syrian civil war continues, Israel's northern border is increasingly coming under fire, with rockets regularly landing in the Golan Heights. And in recent months, Lebanese Hezbollah fighters have launched a series of small-scale attacks against Israeli troops. In the past, Israeli officials have described the rockets originating from Syria as errant fire, or more recently blamed the Gaza-based group Islamic Jihad. But Israeli officials now tell Fox News they believe the growing violence is Iranian-sponsored and directed by this man, Saeed Izadi. The Iranian commander is the head of the Palestinian branch of Iran's Al-Quds force and has long acted as a liaison between Iran and militant groups like Hamas and Islamic Jihad. Israeli officials say he regularly meets with top Hezbollah leaders like Hassan Nasrallah and is operating in Syria with the approval of President Bashar al-Assad. Israel fears Iran and its proxies, Hezbollah and the Assad regime, are using the Syrian civil war as cover to open up a new front to launch attacks. It's we who are on the front lines. We face Iran's terror on three borders. In response, Israeli jets have launched a series of airstrikes in southern Syria. And increasingly, Israel is in communication with anti-Assad Syrian rebel groups, including Jabhat al-Nusra, the al-Qaeda affiliate along the Golan Heights. Israel's new allegations that Iran is behind these attacks come as Prime Minister Netanyahu continues to mount an aggressive lobbying effort to derail the international nuclear agreement with Iran. One of Prime Minister Netanyahu's main arguments against the nuclear agreement in recent days is that by lifting economic sanctions against Tehran, the international community will free up billions of dollars, allowing Iran to fund terror groups around the world. In Jerusalem, Connor Powell, Fox News. More breaking news now from overseas. North Korea today says it has restarted its nuclear plants and now has the power to use such weapons against the United States. And senior defense officials here in the U.S. say there is evidence 
to back up the communist country's claims. National Security Correspondent Jennifer Griffin is at the Pentagon tonight. Good evening, Jennifer. Good evening, Brett. North Korea knows how to get attention. Today, it threatened to use nuclear weapons at, quote, any time. U.S. defense officials who we spoke to earlier today confirm they've seen evidence via satellite that North Korea has, in fact, restarted its main nuclear plant at Yongbyon, where it produces highly enriched uranium and plutonium. North Korea vowed today to improve, quote, the quality and quantity of its nuclear weapons. We will not accept uh, North Korea as a nuclear state. Um, and that's why we urge North Korea to refrain from actions and rhetoric that threaten regional peace and security uh, and focus instead on fulfilling its international obligations uh, and commitments. Too late, North Korea has already carried out three nuclear tests and possesses enough fissile material for six bombs. North Korea's latest declaration comes just one day after it threatened a long-range rocket launch. The satellite launch it announced Monday is a thinly veiled ballistic missile test. North Korea has been working to improve the delivery system for a nuclear weapon. The department continues to urge North Korea to refrain from irresponsible actions that aggregate tensions and violate UN Security Council resolutions, mm -hmm. which we believe that the uh, that this particular uh, launch, for example, would violate a UN Security Council resolution. Its leadership has bragged about improvements to the quality of its long-range rocket launches. U.S. Air Force Chief General Mark Welsh recently warned here at the Pentagon that North Korea has a missile that can reach the U.S. Certainly they have a missile that can reach Hawaii or U.S. facilities in the Pacific. So that's really what we're most worried about. That's why the Pentagon deployed a state-of-the-art thermo-high-altitude area defense missile system in Guam and Japan to shoot down any North Korean ballistic missiles threatening the U.S. and its allies. North Korea is emboldened of late seeing the attention and concessions that Iran has received in exchange for mothballing part of its nuclear program. Today, CIA Director John Brennan warned Iran might break its nuclear agreement with world powers by outsourcing part of its nuclear program to North Korea, Brett. Jennifer Griffin live at the Pentagon. Jennifer, thank you. Now to politics. Tomorrow night, 11 candidates take the stage in the second primetime Republican debate, and all eyes will be on the political outsiders. Chief political correspondent Carl Cameron is in Los Angeles tonight. Donald Trump drew 20,000 last night in Dallas. The latest polls showed Trump ahead, but Ben Carson has surged into the 20s to a virtual tie within the poll's margin of error. Jeb Bush leads all others with just six. Here's the headline, Carson surging. I said, what about me, where's my name? I'm at 40, where's my name? It's unbelievable. Do Trump you know has hit the low 30s, but after tripping up on foreign policy they questions since the last debate, either. Trump rallies tonight on the deck of the USS Iowa in Los Angeles. I want to make it so strong, so powerful that we never have to use it. But Trump has not said how, and he's under fire from the fiscally conservative Club for Growth with a million-dollar ad blitz. Which presidential candidate supports higher taxes, national health care, and the Wall Street bailout? It's Donald Trump. This one blasts Trump for backing the Supreme Court decision expanding government power to take private property for public projects. Trump supports eminent domain abuse because he can make millions. Neurosurgeon Dr. Ben Carson is getting under Trump's skin, and super PACs backing Carson have now raised more than $20 million, despite Trump's attack on his career in medicine, energy, and faith. Look at this face. It was Carly Fiorina's face that Trump focused on recently as Fiorina boosted her name recognition with Trump's own words. He's been dubbed by several rivals as an egomaniac who's not conservative and has no plans. Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker joined the chorus last night aggressively for the first time. The more people listen to this, the more they realize this is not our party, this is not the country, this is certainly not the country I grew up in. Jeb Bush has hit Trump daily for three weeks and the super PAC supporting Bush has now launched a $24 million ad war against the billionaire, contrasting Trump's negativity and pessimism to what they cast as Bush's sunny optimism. Because I am certain that we can make the decades just ahead the greatest time ever to be alive in this world. Tomorrow's debate at the Reagan Library is, a more, is about more than just Trump. It'll also be a contest between the candidates as to who can best channel the Gipper for maximum impact. Brett? Carl Cameron on the road with the candidates. Carl, thanks. Well, Donald Trump already looking ahead to Inauguration Day. 
told a Dallas audience Monday night that restoration on the Capitol Dome would not be complete by January 2017, and it will cost taxpayers millions to have scaffolding removed, then put back up for the big event. Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel fact checks that story from Capitol Hill. At his rally in Dallas last night, Donald Trump offered a new attack on government incompetence by saying the Capitol Dome restoration project won't be done by the January 2017 presidential inauguration. So they're going to take all of the scaffolding down, pay millions of dollars to do that, millions. And then after the inauguration, they're going to put it back up again and pay millions of dollars more. Do you believe that? An aide to Trump says a source, quote, inside the Capitol told him. Trump says he has a plan to save the taxpayers money. If I win, I will let the scaffolding stay up, okay? All right? I'll let it stay up. We'll save millions of dollars. So in the pictures, they'll have some scaffolding. They can probably nowadays do something with that anyway. Yet Justin Kiefer, who is a spokesman for the architect of the Capitol, says that won't be necessary. Quote, the U.S. Capitol Dome restoration project is scheduled to be complete prior to the presidential inauguration in January 2017. The spokesman added there is no plan to put scaffolding back up on the dome after the inauguration. In fact, the architect of the Capitol's timetable is for outside work to be complete by the end of this year and interior rotunda work to be done by fall 2016, months ahead of the January 2017 inaugural. The dome project has a price tag of $61 million, and the then Senate historian told Fox in January 2013 they had a four-year window to get the work done. Take a good look at the dome now because it's going to be covered in scaffolding uh, between now and the next inauguration. Fox News reached out to both contractors involved in the project to see if they had any reaction to Trump's comments. Both referred us back to the architect of the Capitol, and there's been no response so far from the Trump campaign to our new information. Brett? Okay, Mike, thank you. Still ahead, a Fox News exclusive. A new State Department email that raises more questions about the ties between Hillary Clinton's work as Secretary of State and her husband's speaking circuit. First, here's what some of our Fox affiliates around the country are covering tonight. Fox 26 in Houston, where two high school students died when their school bus rolled off a freeway overpass this morning. The school district says two other students and the bus driver were also injured. The cause of that crash still under investigation. Fox 40 in Sacramento, where a community is coming together and making donations to support eight firefighters who lost their homes while trying to save others from the wildfires burning in Northern California. Authority Authorities say 585 homes have been destroyed so far and 9,000 homes remain threatened. And this is a live look at Seattle, cloudy Seattle from Fox 13 tonight. The big story there, a possible return to school this week for students after the school district reaches a tentative agreement with teachers over pay and evaluations. The teachers walked out last Wednesday and delayed the start of the school year for 53,000 students. That's tonight's live look outside the Beltway from Special Report. We'll be right back.